this week at Starbase. Ship 33 joins Booster 14 at the launch site ahead of Flight 7. Construction continues on Ship 35 and stacking begins on Booster 17. Now let's dig into this week's update. A booster transport stand was pulled out of the rocket garden on Friday and brought over to the ring yard, stopping outside the star factory doors. Crews also finished up arming the booster flight termination system overnight. The system was fully closed up six and a half hours after they began. Another bank of high pressure gas cylinders, which hold the high pressure gases that will drive the deluge system at pad B was delivered to the launch site. Following its stay in front of the Star Factory doors, the booster transport stand departed the ring yard and headed back to the rocket garden. Large steel sheets were installed on the base of Tower 2, forming a roof over the machine spaces. Support beams for the roof were added, followed by another roofing panel just a few minutes later, which workers quickly secured in place. The orbital launch mount's booster alignment pins were removed from the launch mount as preparations continue for Flight 7. Later in the evening, a booster load spreader for the overhead cranes was brought around to the front of Mega Bay 1. Booster 17's common dome was brought out of the Star Factory and also staged outside of Mega Bay 1. The common dome section was moved into Mega Bay 1 on Saturday morning. The next section of Booster 17's liquid oxygen tank was brought out and placed in front of the bay just a couple of hours later. It was then rolled in to begin stacking and assembly of the new booster. With the launch of Flight 7 just days away now, the cross beam was removed from the chopstick assembly jig to make sure it isn't knocked over by the forces of the launch. Pad and vehicle engineers apparently didn't like something they saw on Booster 17 systems and began preparations to remove the hot staging adapter from Booster 14 at the pad. The hot stage adapter load spreader was loaded onto a truck, taken down to the launch pad, and sent straight to Pad A. Buckner's LR-11000 crane was moved away from the formal vertical tank area on Sunday morning, making its way toward the D2 gate. This will keep it clear of the rocket exhaust from Flight 7. SpaceX's own LR-11000 crane was brought over to Pad A to remove the hot staging adapter from Booster 14. A self-propelled modular transporter carrying wood support beams arrived in the ring yard in front of Mega Bay 2. A ring stand from Mega Bay 2 was also loaded onto the transporter a few hours later and sent over to Star Factory. The empty transporter then headed back to Sanchez. A ship transport stand was later brought to the ring yard and staged outside of Mega Bay 2. Monday morning began with the delivery of unknown hardware and materials to Star Factory. I'm not sure what exactly came in on the back of this semi, so let me know what you think in the comments. A transporter was brought to the front of Mega Bay 2 to move a hot stage adapter stand to the launch site. The transporters carrying the ship stand were reconfigured in the ring yard with one of the connecting pieces and several counterweights removed. The hot stage adapter stand was driven to the launch site on a transporter, driving straight down to the D2 gate and entering the launch complex. The stand was set down next to Pad A. Continuing their preparations for Flight 7, Buckner's crane resumed its trip to the laydown area near Pad B. These large cranes are laid down ahead of launches to protect them from the turbulent rocket exhaust. The transporter that delivered the hot stage adapter stand to the launch site stopped outside the D2 gate and was loaded with a metal box. The transporter and box then set out on Highway 4. Eventually, they pulled into the build site and headed to Sanchez on the road between the bays. New hardware was brought to the launch site in the afternoon, including this yellow crane component and large job site toolbox. Hardware for a new crawler crane was also delivered to the launch site. Smaller cranes like this LTR-1220 are used for the lighter lifts and to support the higher capacity cranes at Starbase. A DoD-6055 Fire Division 1 Mass Explosion Hazard Placard was placed outside of Mega Bay 2, potentially indicating that the charges for the flight termination system may have been installed on Ship 33. This would be the first time the flight termination system was armed with explosives at the build site. The ship transport stand was finally brought into Mega Bay 2 as work began to bring Ship 33 to the launch pad. 
Meanwhile, the main crane body of Buckner's telescopic crawler crane was delivered to the launch site. At the build site, Ship 33 was lifted onto the ship transport stand in Mega Bay 2. Returning to the launch site, the SpaceX crane lifted the hot stage adapter load spreader above Booster 14 for removal. About an hour later, the load spreader was rigged up, the clamps holding the adapter to the booster were disengaged, and the adapter was lifted off and set down on the awaiting stand. Flight 7 is the first flight that will demonstrate satellite deployment. Workers began loading the demonstration payload, 10 dummy Starlink satellites, onto Ship 33 on Tuesday morning, starting with the Starlink load tray, which they anchored to the side of the ship. With the loading tray now in place, crossbars were loaded into the ship. These bars are thought to help stabilize the satellites while they're brought down to the payload bay door. Over the next five hours, the 10 dummy satellites were loaded into Starship 33. Each of these Starlink simulators appeared to be a bare satellite chassis with the main load-bearing spine and hardware mounting surfaces in place. These satellites will be launched from Starship during its coast around the Earth and will re-enter with Ship 33. While SpaceX's crane was detached from the hot stage adapter's load spreader, three loads of crane supporting material or cribbing were brought to the launch site down Highway 4. With all 10 Starlink simulators inside the ship now, the loading tray was removed and workers began their final checkouts ahead of rollout. The ship's aft flaps were actuated to make sure they're ready for flight. Following the flap test, the ship's payload bay was closed up, indicating that it was also ready for flight. A portable building was rigged up to one of the launch site's cranes and loaded onto a truck, as the launch site continues to be rebuilt to support two launch pads. SpaceX's crane performed an alignment check with Booster 14 before slewing and attaching the crane's hoist to the load spreader and hot stage adapter. Once it was rigged up, the hot stage adapter was lifted up, brought over and placed back on top of the booster. The chopstick landing rails used to cushion the booster when it touches down were lowered from their catching positions. The chopstick arms were raised up on Wednesday for some late night testing, setting up at the top of the tower to simulate a booster catch. Several simulated catches were performed before the arms were lowered down the tower. The sticks then seemed to simulate a lift before the arms were set down at the hard stop at the base of the tower. SpaceX's crane was repositioned at the launch site, joining the Buckner crane in the laydown area near Pad B. Starship 33 began its journey to the launch complex on a very wet and rainy Thursday morning, rolling out of Mega Bay 2 and stopping at the front gate before turning onto Highway 4 and beginning the journey down to the launch site, with a convoy of traffic in tow. The ship's trip down Highway 4 gave us a good look at the test hardware for the Starship catching pins that SpaceX wants to use in lieu of landing legs for the ships on Earth. The hardware is very similar to the booster's catch pins, but rounded off and shielded against re-entry heating. Ship 33 completed its journey down Highway 4, pulling into the launch site at dawn and was soon moved into the complex and set down between the chopsticks at Pad A. Booster 12's grid fins were spotted in the high bay entry and exit position at the rocket garden, and sure enough, the booster was brought out of the rocket garden and taken to the ring yard outside of Mega Bay 1. While Booster 12 was on the move, Ship 35's common dome was brought to Mega Bay 2 for assembly. The booster was brought into Mega Bay 1 a few minutes later. Booster 12's fate is uncertain right now, and it may be destined for scrapping. Regardless of what happens though, it'll live again at a minimum through Raptor number 314, which is being reused on Flight 7. At the launch site, the ship lifting pins on the top of the chopsticks were deployed and the arms were raised up to the lifting hardpoints on Ship 33. The subscale test tank B14.1 was taken out of the rocket garden and brought over to the ring yard and staged outside the front doors of Star Factory. A booster load spreader was then brought into the high bay, ready to be hooked up to the overhead crane. B14.1 was then brought over to the doors of the high bay. The support stand for Booster 12 departed Mega Bay 1 and was brought back to the rocket garden. The ring stand used to bring Ship 35 hardware into Mega Bay 2 left the bay empty, indicating that the nose cone and payload section was stacked onto it. 
Back at the launch site, Ship 33's aft flaps were deployed in their fully extended position. At the same time, B-14.1 was moved into the high bay. The chopstick's lower stabilizer pins were moved in and attached to Ship 33 ahead of lifting. Lifting operations began a few hours later, with the ship being raised part way up before pausing for teams to verify everything was working right. Ship 33 was then lifted the rest of the way up above Booster 14 and swung over above the hot staging adapter. This gave a good view of the modified engine skirt for Block 2 Starships, which has less supporting structure around the base. The ship's position and orientation were carefully adjusted to the correct position before being set down. Switching over to Florida, SpaceX performed their first launch of 2025 on Friday, sending Thuraya 4 NGS from Space Launch Complex 40 at Kennedy Space Center into a geostationary transfer orbit. Signet Warhorse 3 towed just read the instructions out to sea in support of the Starlink Group 6-71 mission. Bob then headed out to sea soon afterward to join the landing barge for the Starlink launch. The transporter erector at Launch Complex 39A was lowered for return to the Horizontal Integration Facility on Sunday. SpaceX support ship Doug returned to Port Canaveral with both halves of the fairing from their Thuraya 4 mission. Signet Warhorse 1 brought back a short fall of Gravitas and Booster 1073 from the Thuraya mission just over an hour later. Booster 1078 finished its stay at the Port Canaveral docks and was laid onto an horizontal transporter for return to Roberts Road. Falcon 9 Booster 1073 was lifted off a short fall of Gravitas in the afternoon and set down at the docks for stowage. The Starlink Group 6-71 mission lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 a few minutes later, carrying 24 Starlink V-2 minis into orbit, tying their previous record for heaviest launch flown by a recovered Falcon 9 rocket. Signet Warhorse 1 soon brought a short fall of Gravitas back out to sea once more to support the Starlink Group 12-11 mission. Doug soon joined a short fall of Gravitas out at sea for fairing recovery operations for the Starlink mission. Booster 1073 then finished its stay at the Port Canaveral docks on Wednesday and was laid horizontal for transporting and refurbishment at Roberts Road. The Starlink Group 12-11 mission successfully lifted off from Launch Complex 39A, carrying 21 Starlink satellites into orbit. Bob then returned to port from the Starlink Group 6-71 launch in the afternoon, carrying fairing halves 185 and 208. Signet Warhorse 3 returned to port with both Just Read the Instructions and Booster 1077 following the successful launch of Starlink Group 6 71. Booster 1077 was soon offloaded from Just Read the Instructions and lowered into the dockside stand. Signet Warhorse 3 brought the landing ship back out to sea less than an hour later to support the Starlink Group 12 12 launch on Friday. This three-hour turnaround is among the fastest we've seen from SpaceX's automated landing barge fleet. SpaceX support ship Bob then headed out to sea just a few minutes later to support that same Starlink mission. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.